2024 is here. There's a new League of Legends cinematic for the new season. I'm going to try and break it down a little bit. This breakdown is going to be a little bit different than other cinematic breakdowns I've done in the past. Usually I watch it live in the breakdown or I watch the Dev Insights video live or something like that. This one I've actually already watched. So if you haven't watched it yet, I'm going to link the regular video down in the description. I'd recommend you go watch it by yourself first. It's four minutes long and then come back here and we'll go through what the cinematic is about. It's given me time to get one coffee and me and kind of collect my thoughts and stuff a little bit. So let's break it down. If you like this video, remember to like, subscribe, leave a comment. I don't care what you write down there. You can write papaya for all I care. Any engagement really helps bring the channel up in people's feeds. So cool. Before I hit play on the cinematic, there's one really key piece of information that I think you should know if it isn't abundantly clear. As Riot moves to unify the canon between Arcane and League of Legends and Legends of Runeterra and all of the Riot Forge games and the comics and all of these things, one big thing they have to deal with is the timeline. I talk about the timeline a lot in my How Do You Make Arcane Canon video, which I will link it's up here, maybe up here, also in the description. But sometimes the timeline, especially right now in this kind of lore flux phase can get a little fuzzy. And originally when I watched the cinematic, I was like, that's weird. There's some timeline stuff here that I don't really get. But it turns out they've actually already confirmed via an interview that this cinematic takes place in three different periods of time, uh, which is going to make a lot more sense as we kind of break down the individual sections. Let's just start watching it. We'll go from there. Tomorrow is a hope. Never a promise. Okay, real quick. So this first section is very brief here. But this is obviously Trindamir in the Freljord um, becoming surrounded by a series of soldiers. I haven't actually zoomed in super hard on these soldiers, but just looking at them, my first instinct was that they were probably Winter's Claw or they could potentially be Noxian as well. Just looking at them here, I think these are definitely Winter's Claw soldiers uh, closing in around Trindamir. And the reason primarily is the pauldrons that they have on actually... I can't pull it up live, but I'll put a screenshot in post somehow of the uh, Winner's Claw soldiers from the Call cinematic, which features uh, Sejuani and Olaf pretty heavily when they're going to try and get the magic cauldron from the Vola Bear. But the, uh, the pauldrons that they're wearing on their shoulders in that cinematic are a pretty clear match for these ones. So this is most definitely the Winner's Claw kind of closing in around Trindamir. It's also important to note that this part of the cinematic, anything that you see with Trindamir is taking place in the present day. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're looking at this. This is present day cinematic stuff. Sorry, I got super distracted. I think somebody's removing the snow from my front steps right now. But yeah, just keep that in mind. Anything in the frail yard, present day part of the cinematic right now. Let's go back in here. Good looking trend here, tell you that. So this is obviously emblematic of, sorry, this is obviously emblematic of sort of the ongoing war between the Winner's Claw and uh, Ashes Avarosans at this point. If you want to know more about the Freljord and its conflict, I do have a Freljord 101, which is very like entry level knowledge about what's going on in the Freljord. That was in 2022. So it's kind of post Mage Seeker and a couple other games, specifically Son of Nunu that have come out about the Freljord since then. I'll probably have to do an update at some point, but most of the stuff about this conflict is still relevant to what we're going to watch here. If you want to know more, go check that video out too. Okay, next part of the cinematic, the part that we're about to dive into is a thousand years in the past, give or take. So keep that in mind. The shapes I used to take. This is obviously Kaelin Morgana, the uh, the daughters of the aspect of justice in hero.
Okay, I'm actually going to pause it there just to kind of go over some stuff uh, that's happening right now before we get into the like second half of this part of the cinematic. So if we backtrack a little bit here, um, as I mentioned, this part of the cinematic takes place about a thousand years ago. And obviously the easiest way that you can tell that this takes place in the past is that Kale and Morgana are actually speaking to one another. The relationship with the twin aspects of justice originally was kind of them both being the protectors of Demacia. But Kale has a much more rigid sense of justice than Morgana does. Kale doesn't really believe in retribution, whereas Morgana does believe in sort of giving people a second chance in justice. And like very slight spoiler for Mage Seekers, you can see that in Morgana's appearance in Mage Seekers uh, when she does kind of give Silas the opportunity for retribution and stuff like that as well. But that uh, division in how they believe justice should be kind of doled out ultimately leads to them separating. Kale actually goes off the target to kind of like seek more clarity from her own mother, where Morgana remains in Demacia. But the two of them fighting here together uh, is the first indication that this takes place in the past. So if we let this go just a little bit further, they're gonna be fighting Aatrox. That was a really bad, I wish I had paused it just like where he'd been like a little clearer. Maybe I could pause it on a better frame than that. That's not bad. Sure, we'll leave it there, who cares? Uh, Aatrox has a pretty long history with the uh, aspects in general in Runeterra. And closer to like the present day, there's actually a fairly large fight uh, between him and another darkened Zolani in the ruins of Akathia that actually involves Kale and Mahira coming down to intervene in that fight. But obviously this is in the past. And we do know that in the past, Aatrox did make his way up through and into the Freljord, which would kind of like naturally take him through Demacia. If you kind of think about the map of Runeterra going up from Shirima, and you kind of go left, and then you go up, and you're through Demacia, and you're into the Freljord. But the Freljord events for Aatrox, as we know them, involve Trindamir, and Trindamir is present timeline, and this is very far in the past. So it makes the reason Aatrox is here a little bit confusing, but I think it actually becomes much clearer in a second. So we're just going to hit play again, and I'm going to let this go through. We really need, what we need is Morgana and Kale to get clapped here. When they get clapped, that's where I think our moment of clarity comes. Okay, so here, wait, pause one. There's a big wall, a big wall to a city. It doesn't really look like a lot of the walls that we see for the great city of Demacia, which is important. So it's a different city that Kale and Morgana are protecting. And if we hit play again and we go just a little bit further, there's tons of corpses, very important. Tons and tons of corpses here. And then, Aatrox has a big, uh, that's kind of a cool frame. That's a better frame. Let's pause there. I don't know why I'm so worried about the frames. Uh, there's a big army coming up behind Aatrox here as well. There is one fight very specifically that we know from the history of Demacia where Kale and Morgana fought together. It's actually a fight that ends up being a catalyst for them kind of no longer speaking to one another. And we know that there was a big city assaulted, but we didn't really have clear detail on who assaulted the city and what was happening. And that's the Battle of Zephyra. The Canticle for the Winged Sisters describes Kale and Morgana in the fight for Zephyra. And in the actual poem thing itself, Canticle, I guess, it just talks about how Zephyra is sort of like beset by a army of hate. Kale and Morgana end up fighting side by side, and then Morgana actually ends up leaving the battlefield to go take on an army that seems to be trying to flank the city, which is the catalyst for Kale not really trusting Morgana anymore. But that's sort of side detail. All of that said, I think what this is actually depicting is the Battle of Zephyra. So I think what we now know is that the army that assaulted Zephyra in that battle was probably an army commanded by Aatrox. We do get to see a cool use of Morgana's chains here. If you did the boss battle in Mage Seeker, you know that those are actually pretty hard chains to break out of, so. Kale goes full justice mode here and assaults. And that's all we see of that battle because now we fade it into the next era that's depicted in this cinematic. So the summation of the previous section with Kale and Aatrox and Morgana is that I think that's depicting the Battle of Zephyra, uh, and it's before Kale and Morgana sort of split off in that fight and ultimately 
that's what leads to their separation as sisters and sort of the split between the twins of the aspect of justice. Now, this next section, we don't go back to the present. We actually go swinging into the future. And I don't think we know how far in the future this is, but it's going to become clear why this is in the future in a second. Let's just rewind it to the start a little bit here, actually. Let's go like right here. This looks good. This is a good, like, high render look at Ionia. I always like when Ionia makes it into these cinematics. So when we first saw, when I first watched the cinematic, I was like, who is this guy? Who is fighting with a staff? And I was like, it doesn't look like Wukong. Uh, don't, didn't really think about who it could be. And he starts out kind of defending this village from whatever force is attacking it at the time. And this is where you realize, oh, this is Yasuo, but he's wicked old. And prior to knowing that it was a past, present, future thing, I was like, when does the cinematic take place? What is happening? This makes a lot more sense now with the context that there's three different timelines. This is honestly just a really cool peek at Yasuo's future. And uh, spoilers, just while we watch it, actually. Um, something that we know from that Dot Esports interview is that this is a look at a potential future for Yasuo that he's been sort of gifted by Kindred, actually. He finishes this fight, he looks up, and he sees an arrow coming at him. That arrow, very reminiscent of Kindred's arrows that we're going to see in a second in the cinematic as well. Um, so kind of highlighting that that's a potential future rather than the given future that Yasuo has been given as a vision uh, by Kindred. Very cool look, obviously with a lot of timeline stuff in flux, we still don't really know exactly how old, well, we don't even really know when the MMO is going to take place, but we don't know how old a lot of people are going to be based on how the timeline shakes out. I will say that there was a brief moment where I thought to myself, you know what, it might actually be cool if Yasuo was like old Yasuo in the MMO when you go to Ionia and he's like, he's teaching you from a like much more experienced, uh, much more lived and worldly point of view. But I think it's unlikely that uh, they make it too far in the future because they don't want to cut out the opportunity to include a bunch of champions uh, that people would recognize. Okay, so let's go into the final section of the cinematic. This is the present day and we're flashing back to the initial, uh, the starting scene of the cinematic where we're in the Freljord with Trindamir. Really cool look at live action Trindomir. So in here in the background, we see Kindred. Specifically Kindred and the Wolf, right? Sorry, I misspoke. Not Kindred and the Wolf. It's the Lamb and the Wolf is Kindred. It's the functionally like the god of death in the Runeterran universe. Now it actually be a really good time to do a short about Kindred now that I think about it. But I think this is probably the coolest segment of this entire cinematic. And the reason is that let's just I'll hit play a little bit and we'll kind of watch and I'll stop as I need to here. Um, Trinomir's alt in League of Legends, and Trinomir's whole thing, if you think about it, is being able to, like, avoid death and stay alive, uh, even when death seems certain for him. So, when we look at this, he's not actually fighting Kindred physically, and that'll be clear in a second. But this is a metaphorical fight between him and death coming for him. Kindred isn't like actually trying to outright kill Trindomir in this scene. Um, but it's emblematic of how the fight with the many Winner's Claw soldiers that were surrounding him is a fight to fight off the God of Death itself. And it's a really, really cool look at Kindred and the wolf, like actually like fighting and interacting, which is really nice. It's really visually cool. But I really like the metaphor sense of it as well, particularly how it ties into Trindomir's uh, League of Legends gameplay. And then here we get to see two ice arrows coming in hot to save Trindamir by none other than his wife, Ash. Uh, and there's a really cool moment here, actually, where you get to see the rage fade out of Trindamir's eyes as he sees his wife. Now, keep in mind, Ash and Trindamir's marriage was originally, like, pretty much just for political gain, right? Ash actually kind of thought that Trindamir's rage and, like, unbridled fury, it's very counter to the Avarosan philosophy where they're trying to get to a more peaceful Freljord. Um, but she absorbs Trindamir's clan that was interestingly, like, destroyed by Aatrox, right? 
Um, Aatrox was sort of the one that came in and murdered a lot of Trindamir's clan and embarrassed Trindamir to some extent. Uh, but they have now been absorbed into the Avarosans because of this uh, oath-sworn or blood-sworn marriage between Ash and Trindamir. Um, but this scene in particular and the way that it kind of quells the rage from his eyes uh, indicates to me that, you know, it's grown beyond just a political marriage at this point. There is there is actual feeling uh, and love there between the two of them. And here is where you see sort of the wake-up call for Trindamir. And now he's obviously not fighting Kindred, uh, but over the course of that metaphorical fight with Kindred, he killed basically all of the Winner's Claw soldiers that were coming for him, even though he was very, very near death. So just a very cool scene, a very fun way to depict uh, Trindamir fighting another champion in League, but to showcase that, you know, in reality, he's able to take on tons of people on his own uh, and just fight them off. But you didn't have to watch him fight a bunch of no-name Winner's Claw schmucks. You got to f watch him fight the God of Death, which is sweet. She fires her arrow up into the sky. More Winner's Claw soldiers come, and we fade to black. So just like a really cool, really cool cinematic, especially juxtaposed next to uh, last year's. I don't know that I think it's more lore intense than The Call was, but there are a few really cool tidbits that come out of it right if i had to highlight them specifically just going through it and thinking about it um other than the fact that you know it showcases some kind of like broad scale stuff that we know happens in the lore it shows the winner's claw fight you guys can't see the th thumbnail thing because my camera in this video is covering me mousing over it so i guess i'll click here but it showcases the uh the winner's claw and the avarosan fight which is sort of an ongoing fight in the frail yard uh really cool for me probably the highlight is sort of getting a little more detail and a little visual aid to what I'm pretty confident is the Battle of Zephyra in this fight. Uh, and a little bit of kind of like a physical depiction of the capital city itself, which we haven't really had previously aside from the ruins, which are used in the Mage Seeker game. We get to watch Aatrox in battle, which is obviously awesome. Um, really looking forward to seeing how a lot of the Darkened stuff shakes out uh, post-lore unification. Because there's a lot of Darken detail and a lot of Darken story that's done specifically in Legends of Runeterra, actually, that I really want to see fall into the timeline and get incorporated into the broader lore. The Yasuo stuff, uh, you know, knowing that this is only a potential future kind of dampens the lore impact a little bit to me, but it is really cool to see old Yasuo fighting. Um, beyond that, not a ton to take out of it lore-wise, I don't think. But it is just really cool to see some, like, Ionian fighting styles and different Ionian groups uh, in motion, right? Basically, you can summarize my thoughts on this as just, like, anytime they do a 2024 or, like, a seasonal cinematic, it just they just look so good. They're so good to watch. I am... Do we ever get a look at, like, his weaponry? Do we get a better look at this guy ever? Oh, right here, maybe. He's not wearing any swords. Uh, he doesn't have anything on. I mean, it is in the future, so it's tough to say, right? Um, these guys are all wearing masks. Okay, this is going to be really theory crafty. Stay with me. These are all wearing masks, right? We know that Yone, like, takes masks from demons that he defeats and, like, or takes, like, faces from demons that he defeats, rather, and turns them into masks. All these guys are wearing masks. Very heavy mask stuff with Yone, is it possible that this is supposed to be old Yone and that the vision that Kindred is giving Yasuo of the future is the conflict between him and his brother kind of resulting in his death? Let's hit play on this. Let's just watch this back one more time, actually. I'm still Mostly, I mean, it's just cool, so I'm just going to watch it again really quick. But, like, I want to get to the point where he charges in on that guy. Yone running is sus to me. And, it, it like, this is a pretty big stretch, right? We're basically just going off of the bad guys wear masks for this, which is not, uh, not a great basis for a theory. Um, so this could just be nobody in actuality. Yeah, I think without the swords, it's tough to say. I don't... I. Uh, I I would really hesitate to say that's Yone. I think this guy might just be nobody. Um, but 
that was a fun little journey to go on together, semi-live. And then obviously we get just like the really cool look at uh, Trindamir and Ash uh, and Kindred, um, which again, not really heavy from a lore perspective, uh, other than, you know, knowing that the conflict in the Frail Order is ongoing, unless there's some Easter egg that I missed, which is entirely possible, right? Uh, but it is kind of good to see that their relationship is evolving um, and helps us place where they're at uh, in the current state of things in League lore. That's the cinematic. Really cool, really exciting. I have a bunch of ideas for shorts now that I can go and make, which is fun. If you like this video, again, please remember to like and subscribe. It really helps us a lot. Looking forward to breaking down more stuff uh, as the as the year of League lore progresses. And it's looking like it's going to be a huge one. We've got the Bandle City game from uh, Riot Forge coming out. Riot Forge also just likes to surprise announce games sometimes. So it's entirely possible there's more stuff being worked on that we don't even know about yet. We have Arcane Season 2 coming, which is nuts. Tons to talk about there. There's going to be a lot to do. I'm very, very excited. And I'm excited to go on that journey with all of you. Thanks for watching. Okay. Bye.